Namaste. So it's evening here, and a big, beautiful full moon rising over the horizon. Magnificent. And of course, there's, there's no question of sleeping. <laughs> Not with this full moon energy. This is a very powerful full moon. But uh, it leads to contemplation. Contemplation of some issues that are difficult to contemplate without one's full energy and full focus. And the full moon really helps that. So the issue is, I recently finished my second, no, actually third time through Vedanta Sutra. The first time was back in 2010. And in 2011, I wrote a commentary on, the, I called it Vedanta Sutra, uh, after the Vaishnava way, of interpretation. And that got me interested in going back into the Upanishads, because the Upanishads are actually the context of Vedanta. Of course, now from the Vedanta point of view, they're called the Brahma Sutras, because they prove that Brahman is the Supreme. So I always wonder, why do the Vaishnavas go to so much trouble to overlay or superimpose their particular view that Vishnu is supreme or some incarnation of Vishnu like Krishna. And why do they go through such convoluted arguments and, you know, outright falsehoods and distortions to somehow or other <laughs> get the Upanishads not to say what they actually say, but to say something different. See, because once you see it, it's just so obvious that everything that appears to be a thing is a superimposition on Brahman. I mean, how else could it be? Right? So... Uh, once you reach this conclusion and then go through the Brahma Sutras again, uh, and then again, making marginalia notes in the margin and highlighting and this and that, and going back and reading the context. See, in between the second and third time I went through the Brahma Sutras, I spent a year studying the Upanishads. Well, you've seen that here if you've been following the channel. So I got, actually, I read a lot more than I presented on the channel here. <laughs> I wish I could make videos as fast as I could think. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way. Anyhow, so you're getting 10%, you know. Um, the meaning of Vedanta Sutra or Brahma Sutra is completely different if you have gone through the Upanishads and you know the context, you know the background. And that is what is missing in most interpretations of the Brahma Sutras, especially the ones that are called Vedanta Sutras, because I guess they don't like the word Brahman. <laughs> What's missing is the context. How do you decide what the meaning of a given sutra is? Because the sutras are extremely compressed, laconic, abbreviated. So unless you know the context, unless you know the background, unless you know the portion of the Upanishads on which the sutra is based... I mean, you can't really, you know, anything you assign a meaning to is just a guess. So the interesting thing about Shankaracharya <clears throat> is that he knows 
He knows exactly which passages of the Upanishads a given sutra or set of sutras, or adhikarna, as it's called, uh, a set of sutras that address a particular topic. It's called an adhikarna. So he knows exactly which Upanishadic passages each adhikarna is based on through disciplic succession from Vyasadev. Because Vyasadev's divided his teachings into four paramparas, one each for the four Vedas, Rik, Sama, Yajas, and Atarva. And the followers of the Atarva Veda, uh, the Mundaka Upanishad, and so on, are the ones who maintained or and, and passed down this knowledge, this esoteric knowledge, as to which passages in the Upanishads correspond to which Adhikarna in the Brahma Sutras. So, obviously, Shankara had access to that. I won't try to justify that academically, because even though I have access to the materials, I don't have the time. And besides, you can tell, because his commentary fits the sutras so perfectly, so effortlessly, so naturally, that it has to be the right fit. And the other commentaries by the four Vaishnavacharyas, for example, seem forced, seem arbitrary, seem a little bit, you know, bent. <laughs> because they're trying to prove something other than the original intention. So, I mean, logic can be used or it can be misused or it can be abused. <laughs> but basically, logic is considered inconclusive because logic can be used to prove any damn thing you want. So, yeah, if you go through all of these commentaries on Vedanta or Brahma Sutra, they all make perfect logical sense. Except they don't. Actually, none of them make... If you go through and analyze ontologically and so on, none of them, neither side, the dualists or the monists, logic adds up as logic. But the difference is that the Advaitin's logic reaches the same conclusion as the Vedas as the Upanishads. Whereas the conclusion of others, like the Vaishnavas and the Charvakas and the Mimankshas and the Sankhyas and all these other schools, what to speak of the Buddhists, uh, don't line up with the actual conclusion, with the actual context of the sutras at all. They arbitrarily chop up the Adhikaranas into different groupings and so on and move sutras around and I, uh, all kinds of nonsense. So, once one has gone through all the uh, Upanishads and then gone through the Vedanta or the Brahma Sutras, and all the arguments and all the references and all the contexts and all of that, one reaches the end of knowledge. That's the meaning of Vedanta. Anta means the end. So it's like being on top of a mountain. If you were to climb Mount Everest and sit on the summit and look around, everything looks pretty much the same in all directions. Just snow-clad peaks as far as you can see, right? And it's the same way if you get to the end of knowledge. You get to the highest knowledge, and, and really it's pretty simple, you know? Brahman is real. Everything else is a superimposition. <laughs> 
That's it. That's all you need to know. I mean, that, that's all there is to know, ultimately. Brahman is real. Everything else is a superimposition. Phony, false, contrived, fabricated. So that means there's only one thing left, and that is to realize Brahman. <laughs> because there's no more to know. There's no higher peak to climb. Every which way you look goes only downwards. And then there's these other peaks, but they're not quite as high as this one. And you can see all that. And it's perfectly clear. So that pretty much means the end of seeking through knowledge. Because there is no more knowledge. You've reached the end of knowledge. That knowledge, once known, there is nothing further to be known. So then what? Well, like the Buddha used to say, go alone to a secluded place, somewhere where nobody's going to bother you, and sit down and do what has to be done. Realize what has to be realized. What you've understood, according to the Vedas and Vedanta. So that's where I find myself now. And in one point of view, it's totally mercy, it's totally grace that I'm here. So I would think this isn't the end of grace. It's only the end of knowledge. <laughs> and grace is higher than knowledge. <clears throat> so there's more grace after the end of knowledge. But of course, one cannot make grace happen. Grace happens <laughs> to you when it's good and ready, or when you're good and ready, and when the conditions are all right, then zap. Huh? You get the insight that makes everything clear. So the only thing left to do is wait. Wait and do one's daily routine and immerse oneself in the knowledge and association of Brahman through the Shastra. So we're going to be starting a reading program, reading from the works of Shankaracharya like a podcast. So uh, we'll see how you like it. We'll see how much you get from it. But I have thousands of pages of material. I have to do something with it. I don't have enough time to make shloka by shloka videos of everything. But I mean, it's all pretty much saying the same thing. Like I said, Brahman is real. Everything else is a superimposition. <laughs> what else do you need to know? So this is the end of knowledge. And after this, there is only the practice of that knowledge. Aung Tatsa. Aung Shakti Aung. Aum Namah Shivaya.